meaning no offense to my colleagues, I'm going to put this little book up here. <laughs> I was going to refer to it, but I didn't know I'd have a stand for it. So uh, there it is. Uh, this is a book published originally in 2006 uh, by Oxford University Press in a, uh, in a font that's a little hard to read, I think, and uh, it was republished uh, in 2009 by the Independent Institute and reset with a larger font and a much cheaper price. So uh, this is the one I recommend if you have an interest in it. It's called Depression, War, and Cold War. And uh, the reason I'm referring to it now is that um, uh, the work I've done on regime uncertainty, uh, which is a term I devised, as it were, uh, at least uh, as I define it, uh, was first um, dealt with in a published article in 1997, an article I, I put in the Independent Review, which is easy for me. I'm the editor. Uh, so uh, even though I'm normally my own worst critic, I, I let that one slip through. And uh, the article is called Regime Uncertainty, uh, Why the D Great Depression Lasted So Long and Why Prosperity Resumed After the War. And uh, that, uh, with a little revision, becomes uh, the first chapter in this book. Uh, but it goes on because that, uh, that was num one of a number of papers I was writing uh, in those days, and uh, uh, they all can be seen as sequels to, to my book, Crisis and Leviathan, which was published in 1987. Uh, from that book, I, I developed a very keen interest in the war economy, and, and in particular, how the war economy of World War II related to the preceding uh, Depression and the following prosperity in the United States. And uh, being an economic historian, I knew what uh, the economic historians and, and economists almost unanimously had been saying about that relationship uh, for decades, which was, as the saying goes, the war got the economy out of the Depression. Uh, well, I was a good enough historian, even though I'm an amateur, uh, to know that uh, there are some ways in which that just wasn't so. And uh, appreciating that, I, I began to do research into that area that, that uh, led me to write a number of articles, and the first five chapters of this book uh, pull the most important ones together. I think they do hang together pretty well to uh, try to explain why the Depression lasted as long as it did. I, I call that the great duration. Uh, uh, why uh, the war economy was not what people think it was, that is a, a time of prosperity, uh, and yet why the economy did uh, enjoy real prosperity as soon as the war ended and uh, resources were reconverted to civilian use overwhelmingly in 1945 and six mainly. So uh, the the whole... Uh, period from 1935 or so to 1948 is one that I, I've been at pains to understand for a long time because I think it's been generally misunderstood almost by the entire economics profession. And uh, so I, I feel like, you know, that, that Johnny, uh, whose mother saw him marching by with the troop and declared, yeah, why they're all out of step, but Johnny. Uh, I'm the Johnny here, <laughs> although I have to say I think I've brought a few people over uh, eventually, and I'm hoping to bring some more over before I'm finished. Uh, I've argued uh, since the mid-90s that uh, one of the reasons, and I'm not arguing it's the only reason, one of the reasons why the Depression persisted so long uh, in the 1930s uh, was because the the uh, private property rights of investors became uh, uncertain. And uh, as a result of their fears about what might happen to their property rights in the future, both their ability to control their, their capital and their ability to accrue income generated by that capital, uh, 
uh, they, they became very reluctant to, to make new investments, especially long-term investments. Uh, when you're going to lay out current resources to acquire an asset which will, which will pay back your investment only over a period of 10 or 15 or 20 years, you're, you're, you're making a bet, as it were, on conditions over a very long time in the future. And the longer the time you're betting on, the, uh, the more important it, be, it becomes that you not be afraid of what the government might do to uh, attenuate your private property rights uh, along the way so that the investment would never pay itself back fully and you would simply have lost money by making it. So it's a, it's a very common result in investment theory and options theory and a lot of uh, ordinary uh, subfields of economics that that investors tend to become paralyzed or you know they become very careful and reluctant to make investments the more uncertain uh, prospects are. Now that, that's a long, that's kind of an axiom of finance theory going back for centuries, I, I suppose. But uh, what I did in the concept of uh, regime uncertainty was to think about uh, this relevant uncertainty here rather differently. Economists had talked about changing regimes of various sorts, but my not concept of the, of the regime here has to do with the security of private property rights. That's what it's all about. And uh, that is not simply a matter uh, of what the law says. And one of the things I've been at pains to try to make people understand uh, over the years is that when I speak of regime uncertainty, I'm not speaking of something that is equivalent to policy uncertainty. That's part of it, sometimes an important part. It's not the only part, however. And so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, recite for you how I uh, described uh, in my first article what I mean by, by um, regime uncertainty to narrow the concept of business confidence, which is, again, an old idea. Uh, I adopted the idea that business people may be more or less uncertain about the regime by which I mean distress that investors' private property rights in their capital and the income it yields may be attenuated by future government actions. Such attenuations can arise from many sources, ranging from simple tax rate increases to the imposition of new kinds of taxes to outright confiscation of private property. Many intermediate threats can arise from various sorts of regulation. Uh, for instance, regulation of securities markets, labor markets, and product markets. Uh, and, and in any event, and this is important, the security of private property rights rests not so much on the letter of the law as on the character of the government that enforces or threatens presumptive rights. Uh, as uh, extreme as the legal and regulatory changes of the 1930s were, the real source of regime uncertainty lay less in those changes than in the character of the people in charge of the U.S. government at that time. The real reason for regime uncertainty in recent years lies not so much in all the outrageous actions the government has taken, including those Bill just described, actions taken by the Fed, uh, the uh, TARP program, the GM Chrysler bailouts, the AIG takeover, and so forth. Those are bad enough on their face. But I think uh, in addition to that, we have to understand that the the Obama administration is a scary thing for most investors. Not if you're one of their crony capitalists on Wall Street. Not if you're a partner at Goldman. Uh, that, that doesn't scare you at all. That uh, allows you to sleep soundly at night. But if you're not in that uh, privileged circle of crony capitalists, uh, you have very good reason to be afraid of the kind of people in charge of administering, enforcing, uh, or violating the law uh, from positions of power in the current administration. So uh, even though good friends of mine have urged me over the years to give up the name regime uncertainty and substitute something 
more immediately comprehensible, such as policy uncertainty. I've refused to do that because that is not what I mean. It's bigger than that, uh, more robust than that, and, and in a sense scarier than that as well. Now, this uh, kind of uncertainty began to emerge around 1935. Uh, before that, in the so-called First New Deal, the, the Roosevelt administration had done a lot of radical things, but it had continually worked with business interests in a lot of ways. Starting around 1935, and in some ways slightly before that, President Roosevelt decided to deal with the threats he faced uh, in the coming election from very uh, radical challengers, people like Huey Long, Upton Sinclair, uh, Father Coughlin, uh, just a host of crackpots that were gaining large followings in this country. E economic uh, troubles always bring the crackpots out of the woodwork and allow them to get followings. And that certainly happened in the 1930s. Every kind of crackpot imaginable had a plan for getting the economy out of the Depression. And Roosevelt feared these people. Uh, he had good reason to fear them. Someone like Huey Long, our, our pride and joy here in the state of Louisiana, uh, Every man a king, every woman a queen, but nobody wears a crown. I love that. Uh, but uh, other people loved it too at the time. That's why uh, some people felt the need to shoot uh, Huey dead. So uh, at all events, Roosevelt was quite afraid of Huey while he lived, and even after Huey was out of the way, he was afraid of other such crackpots. And so he felt that he could, uh, as it were, cut them off at the pass by radicalizing himself, by, by shifting from this first New Deal to the so-called Social New Deal, whose uh, landmark uh, uh, statutes were the Social Security Act uh, and the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which, as it were, unleashed the labor unions of the United States and made them very uh, frightening to investors uh, frightening and forceful members of the New Deal coalition uh, from that time on until after World War II. So Roosevelt's uh, radicalization of himself in order to be reelected in 1936, it worked like a charm. He was reelected by a huge landslide. Uh, and he, I think he took so much pleasure in how well this radicalization of himself had worked that he stuck with it. Uh, at the same time, however, as Raymond Moley describes beautifully in his, in his book, After Seven Years, Roosevelt became increasingly uh, uh, maniacal and paranoid. Uh, he, he more and more wanted to have all the power over everything he could get, and he more and more became afraid that everything that went wrong was the product of uh, machinations of his enemies. Uh, particularly the uh, big business interests that continued to oppose him, uh, conservative newspapers and uh, people of that sort. So uh, it became harder and harder for moderates like Ray Moley. I mean, if you can think of him as a moderate, he really was compared to the people that gained Roosevelt's uh, major attention from 1935 on, people like uh, Ben Cohen and... and uh, and uh, Cochran and William O. Douglas and Jim Landis and, and Felix Frankfurter and Brandeis, they were the leaders of this crowd. Uh, they, they were sometimes known as the Harvard boys uh, because of Frankfurter's key role in, in guiding them and goading them and placing them in key positions inside the federal government. But they became the main advisors in the so-called Second New Deal. And its second New Deal uh, just scared investors to death. And as a result, long-term investment never came close to recovering. In fact, for the entire decade, or more than a decade, the 11 years from 1930 through 1940 inclusive, uh, if you add up all the investment in the United States, it comes to a negative number. That is, Depreciation of capital stock in that 11-year period exceeded the amount of spent for new investment. So here we had a, a decade that was a lost decade in any way you look at it. There was no real economic growth. Uh, there were, we ended the decade with still a great uh, high level of unemployment. 
And we hadn't in any way increased the economy's capacity to, to produce because the capital stock had not been increased. It's the only decade in our history that has that remarkable aspect to it. Now, not everybody likes my idea of regime uncertainty. And in fact, most mainstream economists dismiss it out of hand. Uh, Krugman, of whom previous speakers have spoken, calls it a fairy tale. Uh, he speaks of the confidence fairy. Uh, however, uh, Krugman is the, uh, the paradigmatic vulgar Keynesian, which means he basically explains everything as based on animal spirits. And I guarantee you, my regime uncertainty has a much more solid basis than Lord Keynes' animal spirits, which had none whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I've, I've used various forms of evidence uh, all along uh, to, uh, to test, as it were, the idea of regime uncertainty. I've used historical facts in abundance describing what the government was doing, what other people were doing, and the economic logic of it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see if the government is threatening some draconian new form of regulation. That's going to discourage investors at the margin. Uh, you don't need economic genius to figure that out. Uh, so I've looked at a lot of historical facts. I've looked at a lot of testimony specifically on this issue by, by people in business and by investors. And let me read you just one of these to illustrate. Uh, this was something that, that was written in 1937 in a letter uh, from uh, Lamont DuPont, who was one of the bigger investors of the day. He said, uncertainty rules the tax situation, the labor situation, the monetary situation, and practically every legal condition under which industry must operate. Are taxes to go higher, lower, or stay where they are? We don't know. Is labor to be union or non-union? Are we to have inflation or deflation? More government spending or less? Are new restrictions to be placed on capital, new limits on profits? It is impossible to even guess at the answers. This wasn't a public relations statement. This was something he wrote in a personal letter. But this is perfectly illustrative of how many business people were feeling at the time, all the way from 1935 to, to 1940. At the time I started my work on this subject, I had not read a book uh, called Pride, Prejudice, and Politics, uh, subtitled Roosevelt Versus Recovery, 1933 to 38. The author is Gary Dean Best, uh, a historian who was not an Austrian and uh, uh, not even an economic historian for that matter. But I highly recommend this book if you want to understand how business people were feeling about what was going on in the United States between 1933 and 38. Because Best went to the archives and he pulled out a gigantic mass of testimony. And it's a very revealing book. Uh, uh, I wish I'd read it before I started my work, but uh, I eventually did catch up. So that's one form of evidence, what, what uh, businessmen themselves were saying. I also looked at a number of polls. Uh, scientific polling began in the mid-30s, and some of these polls specialized in polling business people, particularly the Fortune poll. So they ask a lot of interesting questions bearing on regime uncertainty. And I looked at those, and what I found was that uh, the businessmen were pretty much convinced, even uh, late in 1941, that after the war, the government of the United States would, would exercise somewhere between more severe control of the economy and draconian control. They might convert it into outright fascism or communism or socialism with central planning or something extreme like that. After all, it was happening in other places in the world at the same time. And many people feared, uh, for good reason, that Roosevelt would have liked to be a dictator like Mussolini or Hitler or Stalin. Uh, so uh, these polls tell us about the extent to which these, these kinds of beliefs were, were in the minds of investors. I also looked at the structure of investment. If, if bu business people are afraid, they not, not only invest less, but they'll, 
change the kind of investment they make. They'll, they'll move away from longer term investments and towards shorter term. And the data show exactly that uh, for the 1930s. Uh, and finally, I looked at, uh, as it were, evidence that shows businessmen putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, a lot of historians being left liberals or, or even farther left than that, uh, tend to see these kind of business statements as just self-serving propaganda. Yeah, that's just the plutocrats uh, generating PR against Roosevelt. But you can't bring that objection against uh, how people end up pricing uh, bonds in the corporate bond market. <laughs> people don't buy and sell corporate bonds to make publicity statements. Uh, they have money at stake, and they have to think about what real risks are. So I looked at what happened to the, to the uh, spreads between interest rates for high-grade corporate bonds uh, in, uh, over the period from 1929 to, to 1950, actually. And I found an astonishing result, which was that uh, the yield spreads were very small between uh, long-term payoffs and short-term payoffs on, on corporate bonds uh, up through the beginning of 1934. But in the next two years, they became enormous, huge, uh, so huge that uh, to a 20-year pay, payoff was, was a commanding uh, effective interest rate to 5 or 6%. <laughs> Above that is you know several times the payoff on a on a a one year payout on a corporate bond so so the bond market clearly showed me this gigantic jump in what I interpret as risk premiums on the future uh, reflecting regime uncertainty and when I first had my computer spit out a graph on this I couldn't believe it I said to myself nobody's going to believe this. They'll think I made it up. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't believe me, you can go rerun it yourself. Uh, the data are there for you to check. And it stayed up there until sometime between the first quarter of 1941 and the first quarter of 1942. Think about that. The economy is now going into the greatest war in the history, <laughs> and yet... Businessmen now are less apprehensive about the future than they had been for the previous six years. And it's because Roosevelt had to placate the business class to get them to build the war economy, and so he did it by basically handing the war economy over to them, uh, with, with Stimson and Knox being put in charge of the War Department, the Navy Department, and, and, uh, and Patterson and Fer Forrestal running those departments on a day-to-day -day basis, and 10,000 or more, I'm not making this up, there are more than $10,000 a year men, or, or no dollar a year, without compensation, they were called, business people running the war agencies uh, that the U.S. used to, to run a war command economy uh, uh, from 1942 uh, through 1945. So, so once these businessmen were running the economy and allocating resources, no, they weren't afraid of the government anymore. They, they were controlling it along with the military itself. And so they, they got over their regime uncertainty, but they couldn't do anything about it while the war went on because all the resources were being steered to military uses. It was only when the war ended and resources now could be released for civilian uses that they were able to show that their fear was, was gone. And uh, it's at that point, we saw the most amazing recovery or growth of the private economy ever took place in the U.S. economy in one year. 1946 was the greatest year of American economic history for the growth of private product. Never anything like it. Uh, so that's how we got back to prosperity, and there's a lot more to it, so buy a case of my books and <laughs> give them to all your family members for Christmas. Now, I'm out of time, but I just want to say that in the past uh, three years, we've, we've seen a reemergence of regime uncertainty uh, because of the snowstorm of government measures and all the apprehensions that they have created about what's going to be next. Uh, 
because some of these uh, statutes, for example, Obamacare and uh, the Financial Reform Act, basically just create gigantic crates full of invitations to regulators to fill in the details. Hundreds of regulations have to be made to tell people specifically what these laws are gonna mean when they're enforced and administered. Well, if you're in business, you have no way of knowing what healthcare costs are gonna be two or three years from now, none. Uh, you don't have any good way of knowing what kind of controls are gonna be exercised over financial markets. And I mean everything from pawn shops on. Uh, these uh, statutes are written very broadly. And so many people get snared in them who don't even think they're part of the financial markets. And uh, taxes are gonna expire. Are they gonna be extended? Are they gonna be increased? Who knows? And there's just one thing after another uh, that uh, have put investors in a, a frightened mood lately. And so investment has been very slow to recover. It's still, net private fixed investment is still down about, uh, 75% or more from its uh, peak before the recession. So uh, this recovery has been very slight, certainly not enough to, to be the engine of a bona fide real recovery that would allow us to reduce the unemployment rate substantially. So I looked at all the same kinds of evidence I looked looked at before. Recently, I looked at the, just the facts and the logic, the testimony of businessmen and investors, which has been voluminous, uh, poll data, I've looked at the structure of investment, and, and I've looked at the corporate bond yields, and the yield curves have done just what they did before, just not to the same degree. Uh, after the turmoil from late 2008 to mid-2009, uh, uh, we ended up with a yield curve that was much steeper uh, for all kinds of corporate bonds than, than before. And furthermore, we finally got what the mainstream economists always blamed me for not having, which was a quantitative index of regime uncertainty, uh, just publicized in the last two or three weeks by uh, uh, three researchers, uh, two, two people at Stanford and one at Chicago, uh, so they have very good credentials uh, as mainstream economists, and they've produced this index. Uh, I don't have time to describe how it works, but uh, but their names are, are Baker, Bloom, and Davis, and uh, if you're interested, I can give you some places to look for their, their index. It's quite interesting. I, I don't think it's the last word by any means, but what it shows is indeed what I've been arguing from other forms of evidence, that the level of policy uncertainty has risen uh, to much higher levels uh, since the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, and it's stayed there. It fluctuates, but it's stayed at extraordinarily high levels uh, since then. So uh, why is the recovery so pathetic? One of the reasons, and I think an important reason, is regime uncertainty. Thank you very much.